bring out the bell jar. Yeah. I, I, I'm not familiar. I was not familiar. Um, I had to go look up <laughs> Sylvia Plath because I yeah. hadn't been familiar. Tell us a bit about this story and where it comes to be within this, uh, within your book, because you use her as a kind of as a, I don't want to say a test case, but as an example yeah. of where this kind of lifestyle leads. Yeah. So in my uh, opinion, Sylvia Plath, the bell jar, she's got this main character, Esther Greenwood, and she's a great example of this. Um, Esther Greenwood is actually modeled after Sylvia Plath, who is this brilliant woman. And uh, Esther, um, at the beginning of the novel, is a, a, I believe, a junior in college. and She's just got this amazing internship at a woman's magazine in New York City. Now, um, Esther knows that if she excels at this internship, she's got a chance at being an editor at a major magazine. She's also going to meet um, some poets. And so she wants to be a poet herself. So she makes connections. She knows, hey, that's going to open the door there. Um, she knows also that if she makes uh, good connections, she is impressive. She can get um, some, some letters of recommendation. Um, she... Uh, so she's very excited about this opportunity. She also uh, is interested in, in, in men. So she's excited about the possibility of meeting young men while she's in New York City because she's from this small town. So this is her big opportunity. I'm going to go to New York City. All these things are going to happen. She's super excited. It's a, it's a highly sought after internship nationwide search. Only uh, 13 young women are chosen for this guest editorship and uh, she goes to new york city and she buckles under the pressure she finds herself bored depressed anxious at one point the editor-in-chief of the magazine calls her into the office because she sort of senses that something is off and she asks esther um what do you want to do with your life and esther realizes as soon as she asks that that she has no idea now by the way Asking a college student, what do you want to do with your life is a terrible idea because it <laughs> almost always fills them with anxiety Now they rarely know. And that's OK. That's OK. Um, they can discover that. And uh, as, so Esther just makes something up. And in my experience, that's a, a lot of the times what college students end up doing is they just make something up to please uh, authority figures. Um, and so she says, oh, I want to be an editor. And so the editor in chief says, cool. Okay. If you want to do that, go learn five foreign languages. And I think Russian was one of them, right? So like this incredibly difficult language and Esther just thinks to herself, there's no way with my course load, I can do this. I'm not, in other words, I'm not smart enough. I don't have enough time. I can't, I can't compete. And so she goes back and she has this to her, her to her room and she has this dream of a fig tree and she's at the bottom of the fig tree and each fig represents a possible career choice. And one is uh, sleeping with and having romantic affairs with lots of young men. And one is being a poet. One is being a college professor. One is being a wife and having lots of kids. And one is being an editor of magazine. And one is being like an archeologist. One is being a crew chief. Um, and it goes on and on. It actually goes to infinity. She can't actually see the end of it. And her crisis is that she can't choose any of them. There are so many amazing choices that she can't choose any of them and she starves to death in her dream. Um, and uh, so, so to me, um, and so by the way, at the end of the novel, she gets access to contraceptives and um, for Sylvia Plath, this is the, the resolution to Esther Greenwood's problem. But the argument I make is that this doesn't actually solve the problem because um, it allows Esther to choose the romantic affairs with young men um, and one other choice because she's not going to have, you know, unwanted pregnancies. But that still leaves an infinite number of career choices because an inf in infinity minus one is still infinity because that's how math works in case you didn't know.
So, um, says so the English says the English <laughs> professor. I'm, I'm married. I'm married to a math professor. So that's oh! how, there you go. I got we got it. We got it covered. We got all our bases covered. Yeah. So it's an it's a fascinating study. So she's she's crippled by this 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 spirit of resignation. She starts off with affirmation, but once she hits a wall, she's crippled and she moves to a spirit of of, of resignation. She realizes society is too too competitive for her to keep up. Um, but part of, part of what moves her to resignation is um, choice paralysis. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge, part of the challenge of the modern world is that we have uh, limitless freedom. Now, freedom itself is good, but limitless freedom is crippling. We know this when we go into the supermarket and there is an endless number of, of, of cereals mm -hmm. available boxes of cereal and we just we just want to be like can there just be one or two because i need to know you know what do i choose and how do i choose well um and this is this actually explains some of the crisis and when i teach this this explains the crises my students are going to they resonate with this novel so well uh resonate resonate with this novel so well because they feel this acutely and that's why students, college students, feel so much of a panic when you ask them what are they going to do with their lives, what career they're going to choose, because there seem it feels like there's an infinite number of choices available to them and everything. For Esther, it's not just what good thing can I choose to do. It's if I don't choose the one right thing, my life is meaningless. So then everything hinges upon choosing the right fig. And that's a terrifying, that's a terrifying thing.